We hear these words, a part of our preparation from the Gospel of Luke. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The Lord add a blessing to the hearing, reading, and understanding of this holy word. And the second scripture reading for today is from the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke. The passage that Bromley read was about the announcement of the meaning of the coming of John the Baptist into the world, the one who would prepare the way for the Lord the one who would prepare the way for the one who brings the way of peace. And then we skip uh, over much of a lifetime to John's adulthood, when he has begun his public ministry, his calling to prepare the way of the Lord. In the third chapter of Luke it says, In the fifteenth year, of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Lysanus ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Thanks be to God for this word of life. I began to serve my first church when I was just 26 years old. I was the one and only pastor of a congregation in Winnebago, Illinois, a small farm community just west of Rockford. When I started there in 1990, I look back now and it seems like it was a different world. I could dial only five numbers on a rotary dial phone and call somebody else in town. We still had to walk to the post office to pick up our mail every day. For you younger ones, mail is, um, well, it's hard to explain. It was, um, you know, like many small towns, a tight-knit community. I guess, I guess we would call it a conservative community, although it seems that those were different days 
days before polarization has reached quite the fevered pitch it's at now. And I didn't experience it so much as conservative, just as, you know, everyday people. But anyway, it was a tight-knit community with all the good and the bad implications of that. People knew each other, for sure, which was good, but people knew each other's business, which wasn't necessarily always good. People were always watching out for each other, which was good, but people were always watching each other, which wasn't necessarily so good. Anyway, it was pretty easy for me to get to know people in the midst of this community, and as a pastor, I was exposed to really just the full breadth of life in the midst of this community. There was lots of ordinary stuff going on. Middle school girls basketball games were like a highlight of my week some of the, some of the time. There were just, you know, people living out their lives for better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health as long as they lived. But there was crazy stuff going on as well. And I wonder sometimes if we think of um, Hinsdale as a place where people are able to perhaps hide some of the craziness a little bit better than maybe some other places, but at least I as the pastor of that small town, in that small town, saw all of it. There was the time when I got a call from a couple in the church in the middle of the night. On the phone, the wife said that the husband had a shotgun pointed at her because he had just found out that their first child wasn't his, but was the result of an affair that she had had about three years earlier. Um, of course, I missed the class in seminary where they teach you how to deal with this kind of situation. So I hopped in the car and went immediately over to the house without calling the police for some reason. No one was shot that night and they were actually still married four years later with another child when I left that community no longer served that church. There was one couple in the church who lived out their Christian faith by serving as foster parents for most of their married life. They didn't have any biological children, but they had several kids, each for a number of years. When I was there, what really turned out to be a sad story unfolded. This couple had a mid-teenager, mid-range mid teenager, who they first took into their family when he was about 10. They were a loving family, maybe a little too strict on the discipline in my point of view, but they probably learned from experience how they needed to handle those types of things. I would say that they treated this boy as one of their own. But as I said, they didn't have any kids of their own biologically, so it wasn't like they treated him as one of her own. It's just that he was one of their own, at least as much as anybody else was. This couple brought him into their home and into their lives. Adoption, or foster parenting in this case, it's kind of a risky business, of course. A lot of things about your life, about you, your personality, your view of the world, your ability to love and trust, all of that has been deeply shaped by the time that you're 10 years old. And some of those things don't change easily. Our childhoods really do shape us. And this couple took the boy in with their eyes open. They knew what they were getting in for with caution, but also with profound hope and indeed preemptive love. Now like most kids who end up in foster care, the boy had known some trauma 
early in his life. And science is revealing to us these days um, what really, I guess, any perceptive person already knew, that early trauma in life not only shapes your worldview, but your sense of trust. And it shapes the very way that your brain, your neural pathways develop. And it can make things tough, especially in adolescence. So to make what's maybe already a long story a bit shorter, they loved this boy as best as they possibly could but he never really accepted his situation. He never really trusted this couple, or really anyone else for that matter. One night he stole their car for the third time, and he went for a joy, joy ride. Uh, he ended up being chased by the police, and he circled back on the country roads out where they lived, back around to the family's house and he smashed the car into the house trying to hit the spot where he knew that his foster parents would be sleeping. But he missed the spot by a few feet. Everyone lived, which disappointed the boy. He ended up in juvenile detention, and I don't know what happened to him after that. You know, that was really tough. The tragedy of it all, of course, starts with the boy's biological parents, the family into which he was born, the difficult life that they probably had, which led them to some of the decisions they made, which made this boy's early life a living hell. There's the suffering that the boy was never able to overcome, and the tragic way that he responded to that suffering. But I think worst of all, really, is that here in this case anyway, the tremendous grace and preemptive love that was shown by those foster parents seemingly won no victory. No evil was apparently overcome. Their love was not ultimately received with gratitude and thanksgiving, or really even quiet acceptance. You might even say that their grace and love were mocked. Their grace and love didn't lead, at least at that point, to new life for the boy, but to ongoing pain and deep disappointment for everyone involved. Grace is dangerous. Preemptive love is perilous. There's always the chance that grace will be taken advantage of, that mercy will be met with violence, that the response to preemptive love will be fear and distrust and ultimately rejection and even mockery. As Christians, we are all too familiar with such rejection and mockery. After all, we are part of the fallen humanity that met God's love, God's mercy, and preemptive grace with the public execution of God's own Son. But in order for grace to be grace, for mercy to be mercy, for preemptive love to be real love, then risk is unavoidable. 
If foster parents, if the foster parents had taken that boy in and shown him love or grace with only the utilitarian goal of seeing him make reasonable and sustained progress in loving them, well, then it really wouldn't have been love to begin with. In other words, if they had loved in or only in order to be loved in return, then I'm not sure the word love would really apply. And... If God loves us only with the utilitarian goal of seeing us make reasonably sustained progress in loving God, well then, is it really love to begin with? If God loves us only, lo only to be loved in return, well then I'm not sure that God is really worth worshiping. The testimony of Scripture is clear and repetitive. God is like those parents who took that young boy in with profound love and pro preemptive grace simply because he needed it. God loves humanity in that same way. And of course, God's love isn't an emotion. It's not a a state of mind. To say that God loves humanity is to say that God is steadfastly committed to the true flourishing of every human in relationship to God and in relationship to each other. And that that love, that commitment, that, that preemptive grace is real and persistent and eternal without regard to how humans respond. That is what the Bible says grace is all about. That we have the free and unmerited favor of God. On this second week of Advent, we often end up talking about John the Baptist which brings into the life of the church in this Advent season that common practice in the life of the church known as baptism and that preemptive grace and profound love is what baptism is all about. Now as I've said many times every person is a precious child of God and it is thus clear that God is not very picky about who God loves. We often call God our Heavenly Father, and God is also our Heavenly Mother as well. Jesus is God's Son, Emmanuel, God with us. And whether we place ourselves with the powers that put Him on the cross, or the crowds who watched him and did nothing, or the disciples who abandoned him and fled, we all had our role to play in our brother Jesus' death. And we are still, still, all of us, precious children of God. So baptism, baptism, baptism is what gives all of God's love weight. Literally, I mean it gives it weight. When we place this baptismal font here, before the congregation. We are placing the visible touchable weighty love of God 
in the midst of you, the people of God. Baptism is the creation of a new community. We think of baptism as this kind of maybe cute thing that we do with little babies up here on a Sunday morning. And yes, it is that, and I admit sometimes I play up the cuteness factor. But baptism is also, more importantly, the entry into a new community of God's love. It is how God brings us as a foster parent or as, adoptive, as an adoptive parent. God brings us into God's family. And God loves us preemptively, no matter what our background is, no matter the fact that we are part of that fallen humanity that put Jesus on the cross. Jesus loves us. God loves us. And he calls us with this weighty water into God's very life, God's very family. Now, you might be a little troubled at this point um, because you might think that you have a preacher who uh, focuses on all the good stuff and ignores some of the bad stuff. Because if I had read just a few verses further in the Gospel of Luke, a little bit more about what John the Baptist says to the people when he calls them to baptism. You might remember, you might have heard these words. He will baptize you with the Holy Jesus, that is, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So yes, the wheat, the chaff, the threshing floor, the unquenchable fire. It doesn't sound here much like we're dealing with precious children of God, forgiven children of God. It doesn't sound like we're dealing with the preemptive grace of God. Yeah, we really are shaped into the way that the world thinks, wanting to divide humanity into wheat and chaff, good and bad, patriot and terrorist, us and them. But the biblical truth, and you know this, the biblical truth is, there that, is that there is wheat and chaff in all of us. God wants to burn away the chaff in all of us. Not to punish us, but to purify us. To purify us so that we can fully and completely flourish in God's preemptive grace. Now I know that I'm relentless about this. You've heard me preach about it so many times. Fighting against the individualism and of our society and lifting up the significance of you, the people of the church us together. But the Luke who wrote this gospel, the same Luke that wrote the book of Acts, of course, that Luke would be mad at me if I didn't point out one of Luke's great literary tricks that's used in this whole um, cluster of ideas surrounding John the Baptist. John says, Jesus will baptize us with Holy Spirit and with fire. Right? We know what that means. Or we, at least we, we wonder what it means. We don't see any Holy Spirit and we don't see any fire around here, certainly when we do baptisms, do we? No. But think about it. Holy Spirit. Fire. Does it sound familiar? The book of Acts, written by the same author as the Gospel of Luke, the day of Pentecost, the birth day of the church. Divided tongues, it says, as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit to be 
covered by the waters of baptism means to be covered by the preemptive grace of God and to be brought into the church, to be shaped by the identity, the fellowship, and the faith and the service of the body of people who worship God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, how God does it, the love with which God does it, is certainly a mystery. But what God does in baptism is no mystery at all. God binds us together as a new people called church to love and serve the God whom we come to adore. Here, with water, all of us covered by its wetness. We are called into the church as we are bathed by God's love. Precious, forgiven children, covered with God's preemptive grace, God's free and unmerited favor. The story I told about that young boy brought into that family, cared for, loved, claimed, chosen, and yet unable to accept it. I said at the end of that story that I don't know what happened to that boy. It's true, I don't know. But what I do know is that his story in this lifetime is unknown. It's untold. And yet his story in the family of God is known for sure. He is claimed as each of us are by God's free and unmerited favor now and forever. Amen.